Bullet Tuckley um, is about advanced attacks, and I think we've all heard so much about these attacks in the news. Every week, it seems another company, a, a large company, is being breached and having either their information, intellectual property stolen, or their customer data stolen. Rather than talk about how this happens, I, I thought I would show you. I thought it would be a, a lot more interesting if I put us all in the driver's seat of an advanced attack, and so we can see from an attacker's perspective, how one of these attacks operate and what, is, uh, what are the abilities of, of, uh, of an advanced attacker. But before we do that, we need to learn some basics, right? So just a few slides on how this attack uh, will be initiated. Today, the goal of these attacks ultimately is to steal some sort of digital asset. To do that, we need to issue instructions onto a computer, right? So the, the goal of the attacker in one way or the other is to tell that victim machine what to do, and we do that by issuing instructions to it. Now there's a few ways <coughs> that we can do this. We know today that at a very high level, we have applications on our machines, and we have data on our machines. We know that those applications can issue instructions to our computer those applications will tell our computer what to do. Whereas data is really just data to be manipulated by those applications. Today in 2015, we all know don't open any EXEs that come as attachments in your email, and this is why uh, we avoid that, because you don't know what those instructions are when you're, when you're opening that EXE. However, we feel a little bit safer about opening documents, because documents are just data, and it should, shouldn't be the fact that these documents um, can issue instructions to our machine, uh, which will in some way adversely affect us. So the attacks happen in two styles. The first style is to fool the human. Social engineering will find some way to trick the person behind the computer into opening an EXE, and then we can get our, our instructions issued onto the machine. The second type of attack is where we don't fool the human, we fool the computer. And in this case, we're issuing uh, instructions via a mode of exploitation. So I'll come back and I'll explain each one of these one at a time. Social engineering, there's many types of ways to do this. So I can, um, for example, offer an executable on the web that says uh, it's a performance enhancement tool or maybe a free antivirus tool. I can mislead as to the purpose of the tool. You'll want that function, you'll download it, but in fact, the tool itself is malware. Now, <clears throat> there's some advantages to doing that. It's pretty easy today to, to uh, in a, across a very large population, at least fool some people into opening these EXEs. The other way is more difficult, and this is to attack through exploitation. In this case, the attack isn't in an executable. It actually is in a document. It could be in a PDF document, or a Microsoft Office document, or maybe even a document in your browser, in which case it would be HTML, a web page. So by opening that type of content, if I can trick the machine into executing code from one of these documents, I can fool the computer. I don't need to fool the human. So what is that look like? How do I fool the computer? Well, today, all applications have bugs. Right? <clears throat> Some of those bugs have security implications. So if I can attack that bug in such a way that I pass information to it, that it tricks that application into treating my data like instructions, then I can have malware be in a document. Right? And so that Security, uh, that, that, that bug, which is having security implications, is called a vulnerability. And attacking or exploiting that vulnerability is called an exploit. Now we see these happen all the time. <coughs> Here's a Microsoft security advisory. Vulnerability in Internet Explorer could allow remote execution. What does that mean? That means if you view the wrong web page, in this vulnerable version of Internet Explorer, 
someone somewhere on the internet who's hosting that web page can take over your computer. They can remotely issue instructions to your computer just by viewing the web page. You don't need to download, you don't need to install. <coughs> it's, a, uh, it's a vulnerability that's being exploited and just viewing the page is enough to give the attacker full access to your machine. This is why patching is so important, right? We patch and we see all the times pop-ups from Adobe Flash and Windows saying it's time to patch. Those are vulnerabilities or bugs that need to be patched, so this type of thing shouldn't happen. However, as soon as you patch, there's often a new version of applications, and those new versions have new bugs. There's new bugs or new vulnerabilities. And so we're in a perpetual state of trying to stamp out these vulnerabilities, and at any given time, there are vulnerabilities ex that exist, even if you are fully patched, which an attacker can use to exploit your system. So that's the background, and with the remaining time that I have, let me put you behind the wheel of an advanced attack. Let's see what one of these attacks, we won't do the social engineering type, we will attack by exploiting a vulnerability in Microsoft Word. So here I have two machines. The machine on the bottom is the victim machine, and this machine could be any machine in your organization. It could be the machine of the CEO, the machine of the finance person, receptionist, anyone's laptop or desktop machine. And in the upper corner, I have the attacking machine. And the attacking machine could be in anywhere, anywhere in the world, doesn't have to be here in Hong Kong. This attacking machine is running a tool called Ghost Rat. Rat stands for Remote Administration Tool and that gives you some idea of the capability or the function of this tool. Now when we say, <coughs> excuse me, when we say attacking machine, it's not really that this attacker is trying to break into the network. Today that's quite hard to do. Today there are many security devices which try and keep bad things out coming in from the internet. But those same security devices have policy with respect to outgoing connections and those outgoing connections are often more lenient because our internal users need to do things like surf the web and send email. So we're a little bit less restrictive with our outgoing connections than we are with the incoming connections from the internet. And today that's how the attackers will attack. They'll attack by abusing an outgoing connection. In fact, it's the job of this attacker to trick this victim into making an outgoing connection over the internet to land on the attacking server and to connect to the ghost rat tool. So how do we do that? Well, the attacker can start with some reconnaissance. They can go to your, your company's website. Today, most websites have a career section. On that career section are a list of jobs that that company is hiring for. The attacker can pick one of those jobs, build a resume, put some malware in that resume, and send it off to the HR department. It's very targeted. Would the HR department open it? Very likely. It's for a job they're trying to hire for. They're trying to do, uh, they're trying to fill their responsibilities as HR. So that's what we've done here. We've received an email message. Dear HR recruiter, I saw on your career portal, you have the opening for a financial manager. I have 20 years of experience, so on and so forth. Please see my resume. And here is the resume. Now when the victim opens this, they will see a resume document. But in the background, the malware is taking hold of this machine. It's calling out over the internet, and you can see a connection has just appeared in the Ghost Rat tool. At this point, the attack is over. It doesn't matter if the victim closes the resume or even closes the email. There's now a bi-directional communication channel between the attacker and the victim. So, <coughs> What are the attack capability? Well, we can take a look. Here's all of the things the attacker can do on the victim machine. And notice this isn't like Hollywood. If this was Hollywood, I'd be wearing a hoodie and I'd be typing a command line very fast and things you didn't understand. But this is a GUI-based tool that anyone can use. So there's a low barrier of entry to these types of attacks. 
So let's say this organization has spent the last 10 years and, and maybe $50 million designing the newest jet engine. The attacker can access a file manager. The file manager is in two sections. The top section is the hard drive on the local machine, and the bottom section is the hard drive on the victim machine. The attacker can simply walk the hard drive on the victim's computer and find what's on the desktop. On the local machine, just for simplicity's sake, we'll navigate to the desktop as well. And now if I want to steal that confidential schematic out of this organization, it's simply a drag and drop. Watch on the desktop here. And I've just saved myself 10 years and $50 million. And that's what's happening with cyber attacks today. What else can the attacker do? Well, the attacker also has access to a keylogger. This keystroke logger will record all of the keyboard presses on the victim machine. So if, for example, I have a password protected file, as I type in the password, those keystrokes are revealed to the attacker. So imagine the victim machine is of uh, the marketing director, and the marketing director is updating the company's Facebook or Twitter page. Now the attacker has those credentials. Or even worse, imagine this victim machine is the machine of the company's uh, Active Directory Administrator. Now the attacker has admin credentials on the network, can move laterally within the network without even using any malware at all. At this point, he's using valid credentials. So what else can the attacker do? Well, the attacker can also do a screen capture. This screen capture is a live screen capture, and he's sitting and watching everything that the victim is doing. Right? So it's as if the attacker is standing behind the victim, looking over the shoulder. Well, that's interesting, but what if instead of standing behind the victim, the attacker could spin around and face the victim? Well, if there's a webcam connected onto the victim machine, the attacker can connect to that webcam. And in fact, with this tool, they're able to see the face of the victim that they're attacking. Right, so that's a lot of capability in the hands of the attacker. And notice the victim desktop. There's no pop-ups here. The machine isn't running slow. Nothing's crashing. From the victim's point of view, everything's normal. There's no indication that someone is remotely connected to the machine, someone is transferring data, someone is accessing the keyboard or the webcam. It's all invisible to the victim. The other thing we need to think about is that this attacker, or rather this victim, has now opened a huge security hole into their corporate network. What did this victim do wrong? Right? What can we do to prevent this from happening next time? Well, in fact, the victim didn't do anything wrong at all. Remember how this attack started. The victim simply opened one document, and the attacker had all of this impact as a result of simply opening one document. So it's Saturday today. How many documents have you opened last week? Thank you for your time.